Welcome to our women's Bible study called Solomon and the House of the Lord. Today we're going to cover 1 Kings chapters 1, 2, and 3. And last week when we started with the introduction, we talked about the plan. Uh, and we pointed out that it has always been God's desire to dwell among his people. And that he had finally revealed now the place where he would dwell among them, just as he had told Moses centuries ago. I want to take just a minute and read through um, a fairly sizable section of Deuteronomy where God had promised this. I'll put it up on the screen so you can just follow along. Deuteronomy 12, starting in verse 2. This is what the Lord had said years ago. You shall surely destroy all the places where the nations whom you shall dispossess served their gods. You shall tear down their altars. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way, but you shall seek the place that the Lord your God will choose out of all of your tribes to put his name and make his habitation there. There you shall go, and there you shall bring your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, tithes, contribution that you present, vow offerings, free will offerings, and the firstborn of your herd and your flock. And there you shall eat before the Lord your God. And you shall rejoice, you and your households, in all that you undertake in which the Lord your God has blessed you. So see, it was always God's plan for him to select a place, put his name there, and Israel to be able to come together and worship in that way. And this reminds us of the importance of the house of the Lord, because that's one of our focuses for this Bible study. So that was the plan. Now this week's lesson centers on the person, and so we get to dig in and really take a look at Solomon who will build the house of the Lord. So let's get started. First Kings chapter one, it says, now David was old and advanced in years. And although they covered him with cloths, he could not get warm. Therefore his servants said, let a young woman be brought for my Lord, the King and let her wait on the King and be in his service. Let her lie in your arms that my Lord, the King may be warm. And my husband always points out that this is a man's, um, solution to a health problem. <laughs> this is what men would come up with. <clears throat> So they sought for a beautiful young woman throughout the territory of Israel, and they found Abishag the Shunammite and brought her to the king, and the young woman was very beautiful, and she was of service to the king and attended to him, but the king knew her not. In other words, they did not have sexual relations. However, she was considered a concubine of the king. And so we're intended to note here from this opening passage that David is quite old and infirmed. He has health problems. We're intended to note that Abishag was brought into service. We'll hear about her again. And we are intended to consider her a concubine because of the relationship that they had. So since David is now old and probably not very good at kinging any longer, uh, one of his sons decided to seize the opportunity to seize the throne. Here we go. Verse 5, Adonijah, the son of Haggith, exalted himself, saying, I will be king. And he prepared for himself chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him. And we wonder, why did he presume that he could make himself king? Well, two reasons. First of all, he was used to getting whatever he wanted. The next verse says, his father had never at any time displeased him by asking, why have you done thus and so? In other words, he was not disciplined. Second reason, he was good looking. He was also a very handsome man. And that is just the way of the world. People tend to respond to good looking people differently, a little bit more warmly. And so there are some life lessons here. Now look, when we go through the Old Testament, it is primarily intended to tell us the history, the story, the unfolding story of God's redemption, right? But we are not necessarily supposed to draw moral lessons. That's not the primary purpose, is to draw moral lessons. However, there are moral lessons. There are applications we can make. So as we go through the scripture, I'll remind you, we always want to look at it and say, what does it say? What does it mean? 
what does it mean to me? And that is where we can draw some life applications. So right here, we have some life applications. Displeasing our children for their maturity is a good thing. We call it discipline. The other thing that we learn is it is not easy to displease our children. <laughs> it is a discipline. <clears throat> uh, it's hard for us. And the other thing we learn from this, it's the cute ones that are the hardest. <laughs> you know what? I see your pictures on Facebook, your cute little kids. And I'll sh sometimes I'll show Paul, I'll say, look at this. <laughs> Isn't he adorable? You know, they're the hard ones to discipline. So just set your mind on the task right now. And it ends up reminding us that Adonijah was born next after Absalom. In other words, of all the brothers born that are now passed on, he is the oldest. And so presumably, in a lot of worlds, that would make him next for um, the king. And he got Joab the commander and Abiathar the priest on his side, but not Zadok, nor Benaiah, nor Nathan the prophet. And Adonijah went and set up a sacrifice at Enrogel. He invited all of his brothers except Solomon, which is very telling. And then uh, verse 11, it says, Nathan the prophet said to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, have you not heard that Adonijah, the son of Haggith, has become king, and David, our Lord, does not know it? Now, therefore, come, let me give you advice that you may save your own life and the life of your son Solomon, because the next step, the next logical step for Adonijah would have been to destroy anyone who had a claim to the throne. And so Nathan gives Bathsheba a script and says, here, this is what you are to say. I'll come in right after you. And she does. Verse 15, Bathsheba went to the king in his chamber. Now the king was very old, and Abishag the Shunammite was attending the king. Awkward. And Bathsheba <laughs> bowed and paid homage to the king. And the king said, what do you desire? And she said, my lord, you swore to your servant by the Lord your God, saying, Solomon your son shall reign after me, and he shall sit on my throne. And now behold, Adonijah is king, although you, my lord the king, do not know it. And so she told David everything that Adonijah has done that David was unaware of. And while she was telling him that, in walks Nathan the prophet, just as they had planned. Verse 24, Nathan said, My lord the king, have you said Adonijah shall reign after me and sit on my throne? And then he told David everything he knew about what Adonijah had done and who was invited and who wasn't invited, ending with verse 27, has this thing been brought about by my lord the king? And you've not told your servants? Who should sit on the throne of my lord the king after him? And so now David realized that this was a very, very serious matter. And he wanted to make sure that all the important people in his life uh, knew <clears throat> that Solomon for sure would reign on the throne after him. And in fact, they would begin that process today. So beginning with Bathsheba, David said in verse 30, As I swore to you by the Lord, the God of Israel, saying, Solomon, your son, shall reign after me, and he shall sit on my throne in my place, even so I will do this day. And then to Zadok, Nathan, and Benaiah, as they came in, the king said to them in verse 33, Take with you the servants of your Lord, have Solomon and my king ride on my own mule, which shows a sign of possession, a sign of importance, and bring him down to Gihon. Let Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet there anoint him king over Israel, and then blow the trumpet and say, Long live King Solomon. You shall come up after him, and he shall come and sit on my throne, for he shall be king in my place, and I have appointed him to be ruler." Verse 39, Zadok took the horn of oil from the tent, anointed Solomon, and then they blew the trumpet. And all the people said, long live King Solomon. And all the people went up after him, playing on pipes and rejoicing with great joy so that the earth was split by their noise. So this wasn't done 
in secret. The marketing department had come and made a big splash out of all of this. Everyone knew, and you can guess what effect it had on the other king, the other brother. Verse 41, Adonijah and all the guests who were with him heard it as they finished feasting. And when Joab heard the sound of the trumpet, he said, what does this uproar in the city mean? And he sounds worried, and he should be. And Jonathan, the son of Abiathar, the priest came, and Adonijah assumed he was friendly because he's the son of the priest who had, was with him. But Jonathan said, King David has made Solomon king. And he has Zadok, Nathan, and Benaiah, and he's riding on the king's mule. And what's more, everyone is congratulating King David about this. Look at verse 47, the end. The people are saying, may your God make the name of Solomon more famous than yours and make his throne greater than your throne. So in this moment, it seems as though all Israel is happy that Solomon is on the throne. And so you can guess how Adonijah feels and how frightened he is. So in verse 50, it says, he arose and he took hold of the horns of the altar. We're not told which altar, but hey, do you guys remember playing tag when you were kids, right? There was always like home base, like it was a tree or a door or something. And if you could run and touch that thing, you were safe. That's what he's doing. That the horns of the altar are home base. This wasn't a Hebrew thing. This was a pagan thing. But that's what he did. So this sets up Solomon's first real drama in his reign. He just got crowned king. And now he's got a thing to deal with, right? This brother, what to do about him. And what Solomon does here with Adonijah, we can drop into our important life skills bucket, okay? Because when, what do we do when people oppose us or when people cause us grief? Well, one thing we can do is strive to de-escalate the situation. Let's all just calm down here. <laughs> and then Solomon basically took a wait and see attitude. I'll give you a second chance. What his actual words were, <clears throat> if he will show himself a worthy man, not one of his hairs shall fall to the earth, but if wickedness is found in him, he shall die. So King Solomon sent and they brought him down from the altar and he came and paid homage to the king. And Solomon said to him, <clears throat> just go home, <laughs> go to your house. So far, so good. So let's start chapter two. When David's time to die drew near, he commanded Solomon, his son, saying, I'm about to go the way of all the earth. Be strong. Show yourself a man. Keep the charge of the Lord your God, walking in his ways, keeping his statutes, his commandments, his rules, and his testimonies, as it is written <clears throat> excuse me, in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn that the Lord may establish his word that he spoke, saying, if your sons pay close attention to their way to walk before me in faithfulness with all their heart, with all their soul, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. And then David went on to remind Solomon that he would be inheriting some complicated situations uh, to deal with. And that Solomon, as he took the reign, he wasn't going to be able to just coast. There would be things he would have to deal with. And David told him about <clears throat> Joab and Shimei and what, how he was going to have to deal with them. And then David also reminded him about these sons of Barzillai, because Barzillai, the Gileadite, had really shown David a lot of uh, favor in that whole situation when he fled from Absalom. And so he gave instructions of how to deal with them too. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about those in a minute. But first, we arrive at David's death in verse 10. Then David slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. And the time that David reigned over Israel was 40 years. He reigned seven years in Hebron and 33 years in Jerusalem. So Solomon sat on the throne of David, his father, and his kingdom was firmly established for about one day. <laughs> and then he had some hard work to do, okay? Any kingdom that is firmly established, any business, any career, but what I wanna focus on is any spiritual life 
that is firmly established does not stay that way, sailing along on quiet seas. That's just not the way the world works. In this moment, <clears throat> Solomon had, had become established in the purpose for which God had created him to be king. And he was established in the work that God had given him to do. But he would need courage, wisdom, and action in order to be successful in that purpose, okay? In our lives, it is the same. We get saved. God gives us something to do. We are established in the work that he's given us to do, but we don't sail along on smooth seas. We need courage, we need wisdom, and we need action sometimes in order to be successful in the work that God has given us to do, in the purpose that he has given us. And so we'll talk a little bit more about this at the end of the chapter. Solomon faced challenges to his purpose, and the first one comes in the form of Adonijah sneaking around to the back door to see if that might be open. Look at verse 13. Adonijah, the son of Haggith, came to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon. And after some pleasantries, he says in verse 15, you know that the kingdom was mine and that all Israel fully expected me to reign. However, the kingdom has turned about and become my brother's, for it was his from the Lord. And perhaps he thought that this was going to be an easy place to find sympathy. You know, it's something like, you know, I would have been a great pianist. But I was older, and I always had to watch the little kids. And so my sister became better than me because she got to practice while I was babysitting, you know, wanting sympathy from someone as to why your life didn't turn out the way you thought it should have. So he says to her, I have one small request to make of you. Do not refuse me. Please ask King Solomon to give me Abishag the Shunammite as my wife. Bathsheba said, very well, I will speak to you to the king. And she did. <clears throat> she went to Solomon and said, I have one, this is verse 20, I have one small request to make of you. Do not refuse me. And the king said to her, make your request, my mother. It is Mother's Day week after all. I'll give you anything <laughs> that you want. And she said, let Abishag the Shunammite be given to Adonijah, your brother, as his wife. And the way the video in my mind goes, that Solomon just stares at her. <laughs> He's incredulous. He can't, can't even believe what he just heard. And he finally says, and why do you ask Abishag, the Shunammite, for Adonijah? <laughs> just ask the whole kingdom. For he's my older brother, and he has Abiathar, and he has Joab, the son of Zeruiah. Remember your husband's nephew. He has all this going for him. You want me to give him Abishag? And so... Obviously, possessing the former king's concubine is another sign of achievement, another sign that they do not want him. So it floors us that Bathsheba would ask. It confirms our suspicions about Adonijah. And in this moment, it convinces Solomon that now is the time that he has to act with courage and with wisdom and with action to deal with these pre-existing conditions, pre-existing complications. So verse 23, King Solomon said, God do so to me and more also, if this word does not cost Adonijah his life. Now therefore, as the Lord lives, who has established me and placed me on the throne of David my father, and who has made me a house as he promised, Adonijah shall be put to death today. So King Solomon sent Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, and he struck him down, and he died. And since Solomon was getting the, the knack of acting with courage and action here, it seemed like the right time to deal with all the situations, Abiathar, Joab, and Shimei. And so I'm going to summarize all the things that David had left for him to deal with. First, there was Abiathar, who was also a priest who had been loyal to David, but then switched his loyalty to Adonijah. And out of reverence for him, because he had carried the Ark of the Lord, Solomon says, I'm not going to put you to death. I'm merely going to banish you. Just go to Anathoth and get out of here. And that's kind of uh, intriguing, because way back when we started 1 Samuel, remember little boy Samuel, the Lord speaks to him at Shiloh? 
This is what God said. Because Eli's sons were evil and Eli did nothing, his line will be cut off. This is it. It took all this time, but this is the end. Okay? And then there's Joab. Oh, Joab. <laughs> Joab, Joab. We've had so much interest watching him jump from the good bucket to the bad bucket and back and forth. And he had been very loyal uh, to David until he wasn't. And in this moment, he wasn't loyal to David. And so David had said he needed to be dealt with. And he had told Solomon, look, Joab killed two of my commanders. He killed Abner and Amasa. And on his deathbed, David did not mention he also killed Absalom, but he did. And so then Joab tried this free zone, home base kind of thing, and he ran to get a hold of the horns of the altar. But uh, Solomon said, I don't care if it's here or there, or wherever, just he's got to go. And he told Benaiah, strike him down. And so Joab was finally killed, and Benaiah became the new commander of the army. And then there's Shimei who had injured David severely. Now, if you didn't study through 2 Samuel with us, these are all interesting stories that you'll want to go and understand why these people are pointed out. But Shimei had injured David with his cursing when he fled Jerusalem. And in the moment when David came back into Jerusalem, he had dealt with Shimei with a lot of grace. And he had even told him, I'm not going to put you to death today. And, uh, and on they went. But he had told Solomon in verse 9 that we didn't read, and here it is now. He, David told Solomon, Now therefore do not hold him guiltless, for you are a wise man, and you will know what you ought to do with him. And you shall bring his gray head down to blood to Sheol. So Solomon now sort of lets Shimei choose the day of his own judgment. You know, when all my kids were at home, we always had rest time. Our house was a, like after lunch, it was one hour rest time. And when the little kids stopped napping in the afternoon, then I would train them. It's one hour in your room. Like I don't, you, anything in your room you can play with, the doors open, you can hear us out there, but everybody in the house just has one hour of quiet time. And I would tell them, the moment you step foot outside that door, that is when the discipline will happen. So just stay in. You will choose the day. You will choose the time of your discipline. So stay in. There will be no discipline. I didn't know how wise I was. <laughs> because that is exactly what Solomon does here. He tells uh, Shimei, he says, you stay in Jerusalem. You know, keep your enemies close thing. And verse 37, for on the day you go out and cross the book Kid Brook Kidron, know for certain that you shall die. Your blood shall be on your own head. See, it was his own choice. And so about three years go by, and he leaves, and he goes to Gath. Solomon hears about it. Sure enough, verse 44, Solomon says, you know in your own heart all the harm that you did to my father David. So the Lord will bring back your harm on your own head. But King Solomon shall be blessed, and the throne of David shall be established before the Lord forever. And then the king commanded Benaiah to strike him down. And so just like that, the chapter ends with almost the same words that David's last words to David ended with. David's last words to Solomon ended with, look at the last words of the chapter. So the kingdom was established in the hand of Solomon. So let's talk about how Solomon's kingdom was established. He had these pre-existing complications that proved a threat to his overall success. A threat to the purpose that God had given him, a threat to the work that God had given him to do. Solomon acted with courage, with wisdom, and with action, and he dealt with the threat. And sometimes we face threats for the purpose for which God has created us, the work that God has given us to do. There are threats that cause us to not be successful in that. Some of those threats are pre-existing complications, some of those threats are challenges that are just thrust upon us. But we can see from this, I can see a life application from this, that if I am going to be successful in what God has given me to do, 
the work of my hands, the work that God has entrusted to me, I need wisdom from the Lord. I need courage. And sometimes I got to do some hard work and deal with these things. Now, look, I'm not going to put anybody to death or banish them, <laughs> but we all get it. There's some things in our life that got to go or we won't be successful. Will we be saved? Absolutely. Will God love us? Absolutely. Will we be as successful as we could be? Uh-uh. And so this chapter really speaks to me about being courageous with the roadblocks in my life. So then we go to chapter 3, and after we see Solomon show such courage and wisdom in dealing with these complications, then we read, Solomon made a marriage alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Now stop. There's two big problems in that. The two words, alliance and Egypt. They should not be in the same sentence, okay? Now, in the Bible, we know that Egypt is always a type or a symbol, if you will, of the world or of sin. Now, it's not that way in our life. If you go on a visit, if you go on a trip to Cairo, I'm not going to look at you sideways. It's okay. You can go to Egypt. But in the Bible, it has become a symbol of things that should be avoided. Why? Because God reached out to his, the children of Abraham that were in slavery in Egypt, and he miraculously, divinely delivered them, brought them out of there. So any alliance now with Egypt is a reversal of what God had intended. So it says he took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of David until he had finished building his own house and the house of the Lord and the wall around Jerusalem. We're just going to take this marriage and set it up on the shelf for future chapters and come back to it. Verse 2 tells us about Israel's worship habits. The people were sacrificing at the high places, however, because no house had yet been built for the name of the Lord. <laughs> okay, so in all fairness to Israel, even though I explained to you in the study guide the high places and how this is a theme throughout Kings, get rid of the high places, we opened with that message. In all fairness to Israel, in this moment, they do not have a place really to worship God. Verse 3, Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of David his father, only he sacrificed and made offerings at the high places. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. Okay, now this is kind of important that we understand this. And here's where we have a little bit of a difference between a Bible study and just reading through uh, a, a book of the Bible. In a Bible study, you use other uh, aspects of the Bible to help give you more understanding, and it is important for us to understand what's going on. So 2 Chronicles 1, verse 3 through 6, it says, Solomon and all the assembly with him went to the high place that was at Gibeon, look, for the tent of meeting of God, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, had made in the wilderness, was there. That's where the tabernacle was. But it wasn't complete because, look, verse 4, David had brought up the ark of God from Kiriath-Jerim to the place that David had prepared for it, for he had pitched a tent for it in Jerusalem. Moreover, the bronze altar that Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Hur, had made was there before the tabernacle of the Lord. And Solomon and the assembly sought it out. And Solomon went there to the bronze altar before the Lord, which was at the tent of meeting and offered a thousand burnt offerings on it. Okay, so the elements of worship that were part of the tabernacle that God had told Moses to make at Mount Sinai, and he did, are not together, and they haven't been together for a long time. The tent itself, the tent of meeting, seems to be in Gibeon, and so is the altar, the bronze altar. That's in Gibeon, but the Ark of the Covenant is in Jerusalem. They're not together anymore. So they're not telling the story. See, the tabernacle was intended to tell a story. As the people would come and worship, they would understand God's plan. It's been dismantled, and it's been that way for a long time. So this helps us right here understand the importance of this building the house of the Lord. It's going to bring it all back together again. Everything is going to be brought back together. 
So now they're at Gibeon, and we read about the first of three times that God gave a message to Solomon. Verse 5. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give you. And Solomon said, Well, Lord, you have shown great and steadfast love to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in faithfulness, righteousness, uprightness of heart toward you. And you've kept for him this great and steadfast love and have given him a son to sit on his throne this day. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of David my father, although I'm but a little child. I don't know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people who have you chosen a great people. Too many to be numbered or counted for multitude. So Solomon is just uh, coming to the Lord with humility, understanding how small he is in this moment, but how great the covenant was that God had made with David and that he has a part in that covenant. So he says to the Lord, give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to govern this, your great people? And those are two things that are wonderful to ask God for, for Solomon and for us. Lord, I need understanding. I need discernment. Great things to ask of the Lord. Verse 10, it pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. And God said to him, because you've asked this and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or the life of your enemies, but have asked understanding to discern what is right, behold, I now do according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind so that none like you has been, so that none like you has been before you, and none like you shall arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that no other king shall compare with you all your days. And if you will walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. And Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. And now look how his actions responded to what the Lord had said. Then he came to Jerusalem and stood before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and offered up burnt offerings and peace offerings and make it, made a feast for all of his servants. I see the wisdom and I see the understanding flourish immediately. He was at Gibeon where part where the tent was and the altar was. And immediately, what does he do? He goes to Jerusalem where the Ark of the Covenant was, and now he worships there as if he says, I get it. I get it why my job is so important. This all has to be brought together. And so then he worships there. Now, you might be kind of thinking, I'm a little bit lost right now, like Ark and altar and tent and ugh, this is like kind of too much. I just want to say that next week's Bible study is going to go back and review that. We're going to go back and look at the tabernacle because it was very, very important. It is important for us to understand the picture, the story that God intended to make with this. So the first three days, you're going to walk back to Exodus and take a look at that so that we can move forward in this narrative then and look at the house of the Lord, Solomon's temple, which are, is going to have all of those same uh, the same element. So you're going to be fine. It's going to be good. <laughs> and then finally, this chapter in our lesson ends with an example of Solomon's wisdom. And we'll find this through the book of Kings. We'll find that occasionally there's these like really um, vibrant stories that are going to highlight someone's character quality for better or for worse but in this case it will highlight Solomon's wisdom and so the story starts a very famous story there's two prostitutes that live together they both give birth within a short amount of time one of the child dies both of them claims that the living child belongs to them and they come to Solomon for a ruling and he listens carefully and then he retells the story back to them. Verse 23, he says, the one says, this is my son that is alive and your son is dead. And the other says, no, but your son is dead and my son is the living one. And the king said, bring me a sword, divide the living child in two, give half to the one and half to the other. And then the woman whose son was alive said to the king, because her heart yearned for her son, 
O oh, my Lord, give her the living child, and by no means put him to death. And the others said, Well, he shall neither be mine nor yours. Divide him. And we believe this to be exactly the outcome that Solomon had hoped for, that the genuine love of the genuine mother would surface, and he would immediately be able to tell who the mother is. In verse 27, the king said, give the child to this woman. By no means put him to death. She is his mother. And all Israel heard of the judgment that the king had rendered, and they stood in awe of the king because they perceived that the wisdom of God was in him to do justice. So to sort of recap these uh, three chapters, we've been given a really good perspective on the person that God has chosen to build the house of the Lord, and now we're left to wonder, will he get the job done? We're left to wonder, will he keep the charge of the Lord as King David told him to? And we're left to consider our own lives in these same matters. Will I get the job done that God gives me to do? Will I fulfill the purpose for which he has created me? Will I tackle the work that he has given me to do? Will I look at those challenges that I face in the same way that Solomon did and cross them out of my life, take the drastic measures that are necessary? But I don't want to leave you with a weight um, because that's not what our spiritual life is all about. Like, I need to do better. That's not what I want to leave you with. So what I want to leave you with is a verse from a chapter that we had last week in our opening message. We went to a psalm of Moses. It's Psalm 90. And we used the first verse last week, and I'm going to use the last verse this week. The verse is 17, and it reads like this. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. And so I want to leave us with the reminder that, yes, there is hard work that we need to do. Yes, there is discernment. There is courage. There is action that needs to be done. But we can always lean in like Moses did and say, Lord, establish the work of our hands. There's two things at work here. Father, thank you for these chapters. Wow, what, um, <clears throat> what a whirlwind of information and history, but Lord, really useful for our lives. So I, I just pray for that, uh, that matter right there, that, Lord, you would establish the work of our hands. Lord, maybe we haven't thought about that recently, and we haven't even come to you and said, Lord, what is the work that you've given me to do? What is the purpose for which you have created me? And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us to do that, to receive, to hear from you. And then, Lord, as you bring to mind those challenges, those uh, complicated situations, you would give us the wisdom to know when and how to deal with them, and that you would give us the courage to do just as Solomon did and to boldly deal with the complications that are the roadblocks in our life so that we can please you, Lord, and so that we can move forward in what you've given us. We thank you, Jesus, and we pray all this in your name. Amen. <clears throat>